Uh, our next speaker is, uh, I'll introduce him. Uh, he is a fellow of the uh, World Economic Forum and he works in. Uh, chatbots uh, use in healthcare, and he'll be talking about the chatbot reset framework. Over to you, Sundar. Okay, uh, let's see. I can share my screen, correct? Yeah, you can. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sundar. Um, I'm a fellow at the World Economic Forum in the Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning team. Today, I'd like to present a topic called Chatbots Reset. It's a framework that we have developed. Uh, I have presented the framework in a previous conference here. So today's talk is really focused on how the framework was tested in uh, real applications. But I will provide an overview of the framework quickly. So uh, you know, if there are any questions, please let me know. Um, so you know, the rise of artificial intelligence in the healthcare applications is quite well known. There are many, many areas, precision medicine, medical visualization, intelligent personal health records, robotics, and ambient assisted living are some of the important ones quoted in a recent NIH publication. But the topic of today's conversation is within the double quotes uh, at the bottom, the AI doctor will see you now. What does this mean? This is the situation where instead of seeing a real doctor, you are interacting with an AI doctor. And in this context, what do we mean by AI doctor? It's chatbots, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Uh, these are conversational interfaces that are intuitive to users and we refer to them as chatbots and they are rapidly expanding in healthcare. So that's the uh, reason for this discussion. So let's take a quick look at why these are used in healthcare. On the left-hand side of this chart, you see a lot of benefits of the use of chatbots in healthcare. I'll just uh, mention a few, 24-7 uh, access. So you can access them anywhere, anytime. They are low cost, so a single chatbot can service thousands of customers. You can deploy them fast, like it happened in the COVID-19 situation. Uh, and moving on to others, like better digital tools. Uh, if you compare with websites or um, apps, uh, these are much more intuitive because it's like texting, so you can pick it up and start using without understanding any interface or wading through a lot of links and so on and so forth. On the right-hand side, you see a number of scenarios in which chatbots can be used and are, are being used, starting from enrollment in benefits, health insurance, and so on. Uh, one important one we'll see later on is this symptom checking, which is the most popular application of chatbots, and looking for doctors, checking in, and so on, until discharge and another application that's quite critical in the future is post-discharge adherence, like if you want to understand how to take your medicines and so on. And in general, wellness applications, um, or just staying fit and so on. Um, now, these benefits and the wide range of applications raise a number of issues. Uh, as you can see in this word cloud shown here, um, bias is one of the big ones, uh, just like any AI application legality, what happens if the chatbot makes a mistake, privacy, what happens to my data, fairness, is it treating me equally with others, transparency, do I know what exactly is happening, inclusiveness, is it including all kinds of people, and so on. So there's uh, the usual set of uh, culprits, if you like, in, uh, in this, and these raise the need for governance uh, of the use of chatbots in healthcare. Um, and why are we talking about a framework in this presentation? If you look at the graph on the right, there are two curves. There's one that goes exponentially. That indicates how quickly technology is changing and how quickly it's being adopted. As you know, your phone has some AI in it and you, know, you just accept it. 
versus how organizations uh, adapt to this change, governments and uh, even private sector, they don't move as fast in terms of how to control this adoption. And as a result, there's a gap between these two curves, which is the governance gap. And as we know, AI is one of these technologies that is changing much faster than the ability of organizations and governments to keep with. And we're talking about healthcare, which is a socially critical area, and therefore a responsible use of AI in this area is very, very important. Um, while we wait for governments to address this gap, frameworks such as the one that I'm talking about here function as soft governance mechanisms. So you can start acting responsibly while you wait for rules and regulations to come about. Uh, this is a bit of an eye chart, so I won't go through all of it, but this kind of summarizes the project that we started at the World Economic Forum um, called Chatbox Reset to address this uh, uh, particular governance gap. And I will go through some of these details in the following charts. Um, so here's the timeline of how we got started. We started in January of 2020 um, with the landscape review of how uh, chatbots are being used in healthcare. Uh, we started with the interview of uh, 30 experts in the various sectors, small and medium enterprise, large industry, and so on. And coming out of that uh, was a time in March, around March 2020, when the COVID-19 problem became apparent. And so we had held a panel discussion focused on the COVID-19 pandemic and how chatbots are being used in this pandemic. And that was a global conversation, as you can see the, the participant uh, representation here from different countries. And um, in May of that year, we held a workshop to, uh, to look at um, how chatbots uh, raise issues in the use uh, of it in uh, healthcare and how we can govern it. What are the various mechanisms we can adopt to govern it? Um, between then and the end of the year, we worked with a set of global experts to create this governance framework that we are calling Chatbox Reset. And that was published in December of 2020. And you can download it um, at weforum.org. If you search for Chatbox Reset Framework, um, you can download this PDF. Uh, since then, um, during last year, uh, in the beginning, we spent uh, uh, the beginning part of the year with four uh, private sector entities, two from Europe and two from India, piloting this framework. Piloting involves uh, taking this framework and applying to real world applications. And I'm going to talk about more uh, in, the, in the following slides. Uh, what we are doing now is wrapping up a pilot with the uh, Rwandan government. And I will also talk about it in more detail in a minute. Um, but these pilots with the private sector have been concluded and the results have been published in November of last year um, in an insights report that you can also download from weforum.org. Uh, this framework was developed as by a community of people from different sectors. You can see on the top row here, uh, large companies like Microsoft, Tech Mahindra, Apollo and Reliance, uh, a lot of uh, startups um, in the second row, universities in the third row, including Carnegie Mellon and University of uh, South Carolina. Bipla was part of this uh, uh, co-creation and they gave uh, a lot of encouraging and positive comments. Um, and uh, some organizations that, that are involved in uh, public health uh, from different countries. Uh, and you can see uh, it is a multi-stakeholder framework, people from different sectors. Um, and those indicated with the star were the piloting partners for, and I will talk more about what they did. So just a quick peek at the governance framework. Um, the way it was created by this community was to take AI ethics principles and healthcare ethics principles and look at what are applicable to this particular use of chatbots in healthcare. Uh, and that resulted in these 10 shown on the left, some of which are AI ethics, such as um, you know, data protection, transparency, 
uh, and others are healthcare ethics like safety, uh, human agency, and so on. So this framework didn't stop with just uh, identifying these principles and even explaining them in the context of the use of chatbots in healthcare, but also developed a set of actions for every principle for technology developers, medical providers, and government regulators can take to operationalize each of these principles in the various stages of using chatbots in healthcare development, deployment, and scaling. So in that sense, this is a, a framework that you can pick up and use uh, that helps you operationalize uh, principles that you need to follow. So here's an example of one of those principles, safety. Um, you can see in this table a number of actions that are listed um, for the different stages, development, deployment, and scaling by the different players uh, that are shown mnemonically here, developers, providers, and regulators. As an example, let's look at uh, regulator, I'm sorry, developer. During development, uh, they should install safeguards to identify abnormal behavior and prevent manipulation. So uh, this is a fairly broad guideline to talk about the abnormal behavior that could happen uh, by the use of chatbots. And it is up to the developer to interpret it in their specific scenario because we don't want to be overly prescriptive. Similarly, here's another one, design, design a robust handoff system for situations when AI fails and so on and so forth to let's say regulators here provide online user education on how chatbots work. So as you can see, uh, fairly easy to follow and uh, interpretable in specific situations. So, you know, this part of the presentation is on the piloting. Uh, and this chart summarizes the four uh, private sector pilots on the left side and uh, one public sector on the right hand side. So we work with Ada, Omnibot, Apollo Hospitals, and Tech Mahindra. And now we are wrapping up one with the uh, uh, a company Babylon, which is UK based, that is implementing the chatbot system in Rwanda. Um, so the four that have been completed in 2021 were private sector and the one that we're working on now completing is the public sector one. So here are the application scenarios that each of these um, companies on the left uh, applied this framework to. Ada applied it to an AI-driven symptom assessment and care navigation platform. Uh, this was for a large US insurance provider working in the US system. Uh, Omnibot uh, developed a voice bot that you can call with the phone and talk to the system. And it was using speech recognition, uh, similar to Alexa in um, providing information about the coronavirus and what kind of services are available. And this was deployed in Germany to provide information in the various districts on uh, what some kind of services, public services were available uh, for vaccination and so on. Um, Apollo Hospitals is developing a platform called Simp AI, which is again a symptom assessment platform. Uh, and they use some of the principles in this development. And finally, Tech Mahindra, um, did a simulated situation. So the first three are actual applications and Tech Mahindra did a simulation of a patient journey in a hospital and they were interested in the different risk levels, which we didn't really talk about because not all chatbots are created equal, of course. Some are uh, just informational about uh, where a hospital is and what are the hours uh, and others could actually suggest treatment options. So they were interested in that. So as you can see, there is a uh, different types of applications where the framework was piloted, even though you see that the common thread is the symptom assessment here, as is the case in the Babylon case in Rwanda, uh, which I will talk in a bit more uh, in a second. So um, here are the principles that each of these pilots chose. Uh, as you can see, there were anywhere from five to eight principles um, 
shown. Uh, for example, Apollo so took safety, efficacy, accountability, transparency, and explainability. Um, so each application demands a different uh, set of fo focus, uh, especially for piloting where you cannot afford to pilot every single principle because of the limited amount of time. So the purpose of this exercise was to apply these actions uh, corresponding to these principles and get feedback from these uh, piloting partners. And all the feedback uh, has been collected and published in the uh, aforementioned publication. Uh, but here is some summary of uh, what they told us. So the partners uh, identified the following features as the reasons why they chose the framework for their pilots. Uh, ease of use, well-articulated, comprehensive, uh, data sensitivity, uh, addressing multi-stakeholder product, work with uh, different types of uh, players, um, an opportunity to retroactively check prior products and projects. So you can already be in progress or have completed a, a product, which you can still go back and check um, if you are, have any governance gaps. And continuous improvement. So you can start with a few principles like these piloting partners did, and then you can expand to cover the other principles. And sometimes you might miss certain governance issues based on your own internal uh, governance mechanisms, especially if you're a small business, you don't have the bandwidth to think about all these different factors. Um, so this helps us a act as a checklist to identify those that you may have missed. And here are some comments that were provided by these uh, piloting partners. Uh, I'm not gonna read through all of them, but I will just uh, mention some of the highlights. Uh, Matt from Ada Health pointed out that the chatbot frame framework moves beyond abstract principles to concrete actions. And this is important because the biggest problem in governing AI is not uh, knowing what uh, principles you have to follow, but what exactly do you need to do in order to uh, realize those principles? Uh, Joshua, who's the founder of Omnibot, uh, mentioned that there's a lot of information for business use. And Dr. Carr, who is the Chief Medical Information Officer of Apollo Hospitals, recognized that this was built collaboratively with experts in the field. And Nikhil Mahindra, Nikhil, Nikhil Mahotra, sorry, who is the Global Head of Innovation at Tech Mahindra, uh, noted that it's a plug and play model. Um, so uh, let's, let me wrap up by telling you what we are, we are doing with the Rwanda pilot. Um, the pilot went live on the 22nd of November of last year, uh, and we are almost done with it. It's going to be published. In fact, I am editing the report as I speak, and it should come out at the end of the month. Uh, and this was done in collaboration with the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, Rwanda, which is part of the World Economic Forum Network. And uh, Babylon, which is uh, whose logo is shown here, is a UK-based uh, company that has a chatbot that is being used by the National Health Service in the UK already. Uh, and their Rwandan entity called Babel uh, is a provider of AI-based triage tools. And what is this AI-based triage tool? It supports Africa's first digital first universal healthcare system, which allows Rwandans to have a consultation with the nurse uh, by calling from any phone from anywhere in the country, you don't need a smartphone. And that's an important distinction from other applications of uh, chatbots. Uh, and I'll tell a little bit more how it is made possible. It's fully localized for Rwanda. Uh, it accounts for local language, epidemiology, culture, and health system pathways. It is a chat-based informational service that is operated by a medical professional who's a nurse. Now, how do we do this without a smartphone? The way it works is that the triage service itself is intended to act as an informational service for an existing process. Uh, the main point is that the patient calls a number like 911 or 411, and he reaches a nurse. Uh, so he's really talking with the human and the human nurse interacts with the AI system. And that person enters the patient's reported medical situation as an initial input to an AI triage that is in front of them on a computer. And AI goes through a series of questions 
that are matched to that input. So really the human nurse act as a go-between uh, from the end user and the AI system. And, and this nurse is provided by the AI with information about when and how the patient should be treated. Uh, but the nurse ultimately decides the information that is to be provided to the patient. He or she may not provide the suggestion made by the AI system if they consider that to be not safe or appropriate. So feedback is collected from the nurse about the safety and appropriateness of the triage with a couple of questions about was it safe, was it appropriate, and if so, explain why. So again, the product is designed to be used by a qualified professional nurse who is the ultimate decision maker on whether to accept the recommendation from the AI. And it covers conditions commonly encountered in primary care, uh, but it excludes certain conditions like pregnancy and mental health. Uh, and it is integrated with the Rwanda's national health insurance scheme. So it operates seamlessly with uh, payments and so on. So the principles that were chosen by uh, the uh, pilot were safety, accountability, and transparency. Uh, there are a number of actions. We saw the list for safety uh, in a previous slide, and there are similar actions for accountability and transparency. Um, and I won't read through these things, but suffice it to say that uh, the pilot has been successful uh, and the technology pilot will continue for a few more months before they make it a mainstream product. So with that, let me conclude um, with these points. Uh, as uh, we know, use of AI in healthcare raises a lot of governance issues and the governance gap exists because of the difference between the pace of adoption versus the ability to govern them. And frameworks are useful to create soft governance mechanisms. And I presented one chat box reset that we have developed at the World Economic Forum. Uh, and we are using piloting as a mechanism of getting feedback on the framework four public private sector pilots were completed and one public sector pilot is being completed and uh, will be published at the end of the month. With that, I thank you for your attention and uh, I open to any questions you may have. Did you face any hesitation from uh, different uh, agencies you approached or they approached you uh, in using this uh, uh, framework? Why is, for example, why is World Economic Forum doing it? Why is it, um, it's about um, the authenticity, right? Or the credibility. So uh, did you face uh, um, no question at all? It is coming from World Economic Forum, so we should adopt it. Or did you get some hesitancy? And uh, if so, what did you, you do to overcome it? Yeah, thank you, Biplo. That's an excellent question. Uh, the World Economic Forum has a unique position in the world because it is uh, indifferent or unbiased relative to various national and the private sector issues. And that's the reason it has been so successful in the last 50 years in accomplishing a lot of things that other organizations, even such as the UN, have difficulty achieving sometimes. Um, it provides a platform for people from different sectors to come and have an open conversation. And that's what happened in this as well. Uh, we have people joining us uh, voluntarily, uh, you know, and, and then providing this input and including you, Biplav, uh, coming to help with creating the framework. In terms of hesitancy, I don't think the hesitancy comes from the credibility of the framework. It comes more from other factors. Uh, private sector, it comes from, uh, you know, bandwidth, you know, a lot of people don't have time to uh, think about governance, which is sort of unfortunate, because it, it is always the thing that you think not think about at the beginning, and it comes to bite later on. So it is better to do it up front. Now, coming to governments, it's an interesting issue, because governments have a different kind of problem. Rwanda is an exception. Rwanda has always been at the forefront of dealing with digital technologies. In fact, you may have heard about uh, their use of uh, drones to deliver medicines to remote areas. If you haven't, uh, go ahead and look it up on YouTube. Uh, type Rwanda drones and you will see this exciting work that they're doing. Um, you know, I approached, for example, the government of India. There was a lot of excitement from there to, for, for example, from the Council of Medical Research to do this. 
But the hesitancy is not uh, because of the credibility, but because of internal factors. There's a lot more inertia, a lot more other things going on. And we really had a challenge with the COVID pandemic also happening at the same time because the healthcare agencies were completely drowned in, in, in dealing with the pandemic. Um, so they didn't have the bandwidth to try to do this kind of thing. So um, I would say mostly the hesitancy was not because of um, anything related to authenticity or uh, uh, anything to do with the forum, but it's more to do with the situation around us.